A couple of days ago, Elon Musk tweeted yet again about dot products and how important they are to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the responses to his tweet included an awful lot of people asking what in the heck he was talking about. So I want to break it down today. Let's take a look. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So let's start with the tweet thread that caused this uproar, and then we'll get to exactly what dot products are and why they're so important. In fact, I'm gonna actually flip it and I'm gonna talk about why they're important first. So if you don't really care about the math, you can just understand why they're important and ignore the second half of the video. So as you can see, on July 4th, Archelect said, the matrix has you. Elon Musk said, I knew it, ha ha ha. And then Pranay Patel actually had a funny little meme here that said, welcome to the matrix, Neo. And they're inside of a matrix, a mathematical matrix, obviously, and so that was pretty funny. And Elon Musk responded to that by saying, there is so much actual matrix math in AI, the compute power is still overwhelmingly dot products. At which point a number of people question what in the heck a dot product was and why it was important for AI. So in order to understand why dot products are so important to AI, let's turn to our friend the perceptron, which is the very, very basic component of a neural network. So I'm starting off here with just a single input that goes to a neuron and an output. So this is, <laughs> this is as basic as it gets and it's actually fairly useless. You can't really do anything with this, but it, it demonstrates the basic idea. So this is all mathematics here. So Input one might have a number that it feeds to the neuron, the neuron over here, and it might say, let's say the number is one or something, right? It feeds the number one to the neuron. Then there is a weight, weight one, which is associated with that input number one, and maybe weight one is the number two or something, right? And all this neuron does here is multiplies those two numbers together. It says weight one times input one, which I believe I said was one times two, and those things together are two. Then we have a threshold. There's basically something, some sort of nonlinear function. Most of the time it's a sigmoid or a relu or something else like that, that activates if this number is above some threshold. So in this case, let's just make up a number of one. And if it's above the number one, it fires. And if it's not above the number one, it doesn't. And so what we see here is because the number that we got is the number two, it actually will fire. And so it will send something to this output and that will continue to feed down the line to other neurons in this little tiny perceptron neural network. All right, so now let's look at just a little bit more complicated of a neural network. This could actually be used to do something. I don't know, not very much, but it could do something. Anyway, what you can see is we've still got our no input number one with weight one, but now we've got input two and weight two and input three and weight three. We've also got a bias. A bias is something, I'm going to ignore it in the next part of the conversation, but basically a bias is kind of an always on thing. So there's actually, I forgot to write it here, but there's a weight associated with the bias. So what you've got is you could imagine the bias is an input with the number one always. It's, it's always inputting one, so it's always on, and it's always inputting the same basic number, and then the weight that's associated with that can adjust this bias amount. But anyway, for now, I'm going to ignore that because it just makes things a little bit simpler. Anyway, so we can imagine we have our three inputs, we have our three input weights, the neuron takes these all in, multiplies them, adds them together. If they add up to over some threshold, we fire an output. If they don't add up to over that threshold, we don't fire the output. Or there are more complicated things that could actually happen in a lot of real neural networks, but that's the easiest way to think about it. So the basic idea is we're multiplying, we're adding, we're then thresholding it, we're saying, is this number greater than some default number? If it is, then this neuron is activated and we fire it. Again, this is analogous to human minds, like the way that our neurons work. The basic concept is that our neuron, the input of the neuron takes in a bunch of information. And if it gets over a certain threshold, it fires a signal down and it continues on this chain. So that's how the human mind works at a really, really basic level. And that's what we've sort of duplicated in silicon using neural networks. I'll say right here that convolution Convolutional neural networks are a special case, and they actually use convolution filters that use multiplication and addition in a slightly different way. And those are actually super, super interesting, but I did a whole episode on them, so you can check that out if you're
you're interested. So today I'm just gonna talk about really, really basic neural networks and how they function. All right, so speaking of that, let's turn to how they function. So I've got types of mathematical operations that can be done here. Scalar by scalar is the type of math I'm sure you already know about, right? That would be like multiplying two times three, right? So you do two times three, you get six, and it's commutative just in case anybody cares, which means that three times two is actually the same thing as two times three. They're both the number six. So hopefully you've already got that idea and that's no big deal to you. The second one is vector multiplication by a scalar. So this here is a representation of a scalar. You could think of it as an X, Y, Z coordinate, or you could think about it as apples and oranges and bananas or something like that. So you could have a vector of fruit. It doesn't really matter what this is. It's just a way of storing numbers in a convenient format. And then our B in this case is just a single number. So in this case, we multiply each one of these components by the number three. So two times three is six, three times five is 15, one times three is three. So that's what we get. So again, if you had two apples, five oranges, and one banana, and somebody said, I need five times more of these objects, you just multiply that out. And now you have six apples, 15 oranges, and three bananas. So, you know, <laughs> again, it doesn't really matter what this is. Oftentimes this would be the X, Y, Z coordinates. And like, if you imagine something like this, X, Y, Z, right? X, Y, Z. So that could be the coordinates of a three-dimensional object or something like that. Then we get to the more complicated stuff that you may not have seen before. So the first one is vector by vector multiplication. And there's actually two varieties of this, at least for a three-dimensional vector. So you can see what we've got is two, five, one, exactly the same vector as we had before. And now we've got, so that would be called a row vector. Now what we've got in column B over here is a column vector. So three, one, two, it's the same thing. It's just arranged in a column instead of a row. And that's really important because this type of multiplication involves row times column. Notice that these numbers have to be the same. You can't multiply a three vector by a four vector because that last number, what would it be multiplied by? In this case right here, right, we've got two times three, which are the first coordinates of each one. We've got five times one is the second ones and one times two is the third one. So if we add a fourth dimension to one of these things, it would make no sense to multiply it. So these numbers have to be the same, at least the dimensions that are being multiplied together. So as you can see here, the intermediate sort of reveals how this works, but this is the dot product right here. The number 13 is the result of a dot product. Note that this number is a scalar. It is not a vector anymore. We've taken two vectors, we've multiplied each of the coordinates together, we've added it all up, and we've gotten to the number 13. And then just for completeness, although I'm not gonna really touch on this much today at all, you could do what's called the cross product or the outer product. The dot product is actually known as the inner product also, and that is multiplying with the right-hand rule. <laughs> so you take two of the fingers and you make the plane. I think it's actually supposed to be like this. So you take these two fingers and you make your plane and the thumb is sticking up out of that. And basically, if you cross 251 by 312, you get 9, negative 1, negative 13. And it's anti-commutative, which means if you multiply them backwards, you get the negative of the number that you had before. Uh, I actually, it's really a bear to multiply these things and I haven't done it in ages. So I actually went to crossproductcalculators.com. So you're welcome to go play with that. They have explanations and stuff if you're interested. But I'm not going to touch on that because while it's used for 3D animation and stuff, and so it's actually really important for that, it's not very important for machine learning. Next up, we can get to matrix times vector multiplication. So in this case, what we're doing is the same thing, right? 251 times 312, but then we're adding two more rows to this vector. Note that we don't have to have like three by three times three by three, we can have three by three by three by one. So as long as the components that are being multiplied are the same dimension, we can make this work. So again, you see the first row here, two times three, plus five times one plus one times two is the same. So the first number we get in this new vector is 13. And then multiplying the second one, three, one, two times one, three, two gives us the number 10. And then four, five, six times three, one, two gives us the number 29. And this interestingly enough is actually commutative. And if any of this is confusing you, just pause the video and actually multiply the numbers out in your head. It's really, really an instructive thing to go through it and actually multiply it yourself. And then finally, we get to matrix by matrix multiplication. So notice we've got 251 and 312, but we've added two more columns to the second vector. You can see how all of these numbers get multiplied and added up, and we end up with 13, 23, 39, 10, 17, 24, 29, 48, 52. And if you want to check this, I use this just to check it to 
make sure my numbers were correct, you can go to matrix.reshish.com and get a calculator so you can actually calculate these things out yourself. Also note that this is generally not commutative. And down here, just for fun, I threw in a four by four matrix times each other. And so you can see the results for that. And because I like all of you guys so much, I actually created a quick manual dot product calculator. I will post a link to this down in the description if you're interested, but you can see that basically what I've done is I've got my matrices and these are the exact same numbers as the other spreadsheet just for fun, but you can see how the dot product is calculated out here. If I double click this, you can see it's these numbers times these numbers and they're added up. So you can just basically see how that whole thing works if you're interested. So anyway, this allows you to play with it. One of the interesting factors about this is if I change this number, for example, from five to zero, you can see how this entire row changes. So changing row one up here in this first matrix changes the entire row in the second matrix, the dot product matrix. But if on the other hand, I change matrix two, one of these numbers, you can see that it actually changes column two over here because this was in column two over here and that's what it changes over here. So that's really kind of a cool little fact about it. But anyway, it's not that big a deal. And again, it's not important that you actually be able to do this in your head. <laughs> it's one of those things, it's kind of a pain, you know, you have to write it all out and add all, all these numbers together and it's something that computers do really well. But it's really important to understand how important all of this is. And before we leave this, two quick things about these numbers. Number one, I have made all of these these very, very simple. They're obviously small positive integers. That's just to make it easy for you to follow along with the math in your head. But in reality, of course, these numbers are not going to be integers. They're going to be float numbers. So you might have something like 0 0.0173 or five, sorry, <laughs> if I can type correctly. And you'll see how now all of these numbers have become float numbers. The other thing that's very important to remember is that these can also be negative, which leads to what's called inhibitory as opposed to excitatory behavior. So essentially what's happening, remember I said that ultimately we're testing for a threshold here, and if it doesn't reach that threshold, it doesn't fire the neuron. So if we take this number seven here and we make this a negative seven, and so check the second column here, you'll see that now we have negative numbers. So by just changing that one number to a negative, we've actually created a situation where all of this column are now negative numbers. And so if the threshold was some positive number, none of these neurons are going to fire anymore because they're now negative numbers as opposed to positive numbers. And one little bonus fact to add is notice that the bigger these matrices get, the bigger these numbers that get multiplied out get, right? So when we only had like a little three by three vector or something like that, the numbers weren't that large. But as we start to create bigger and bigger. So this is a four by four matrix multiplication, right? And we're doing that and notice that these numbers get bigger. If we did 10 by 10 with the same small numbers, these things could get really, really big. And so when we get to hundreds of thousands or billions of parameters or something, it's very easy to have what's called exploding or vanishing gradients, which means that these dot products either add up to be very, very large numbers or super, super small numbers. Like they, they tend towards zero, like 0 0.0000001 or something like that. So either of those is dangerous when it comes to actually calculating out the dot products when you're doing training for especially deep neural networks. So anyway, these are just important things to keep track of as you think about the reality of this, as opposed to my very, very simplified example here. And if we go back to this spreadsheet, you can see the reason why this all matters. Imagine this vector by vector thing is our little neural network here, right? So this is our vectors, input one, two, three, they have some numbers, and weight one, two, three, those are some other numbers. We multiply them together, we add add them and then we check to see whether that number is bigger than some threshold and we then fire it to an output if it is bigger. So same thing right here. But then the beauty of this is if you have bigger and bigger neural networks, you can actually make this into matrix multiplication because you could have multiple inputs and outputs that are being multiplied together and you can turn this from matrices to tensors which are multi-dimensional matrices. So this matrix is a two-dimensional matrix, right? It's three by three, this, this matrix right here. This is a two-dimensional matrix of four by four four, but you could have a three dimensional matrix, a four dimensional matrix, a 10 dimensional matrix, a thousand dimensional matrix, whatever you want, you can do with matrix math. It's all the same thing. You're just multiplying and adding things up. And the other really cool part about this is you can parallelize the entire thing, which means on something like a GPU, which is designed to do really, really fast matrix multiplication, you can multiply little pieces of the matrix and add them together. So like each row or something like that, you could do one row by one column on one little piece.
piece of the GPU, one thread, and then you can do a thousand others at exactly the same time on the thousand other threads. And that's the exact reason why GPUs are so, so fast. They're really good at multiplying and adding things together in parallel, which is really important for like games and things like that. It just happens to conveniently also be good for AI and machine learning training and inference. So I hope that helps to explain how all of this stuff works. Again, it's just multiplication and addition. It's just doing it in a very precise way between matrices or vectors or tensors or however you want to think about this. But basically, it's just multiplying two numbers together and adding them up and then continuing to add things up. And then at the end, you check whether that number happens to be bigger than some default number that you're interested in. And if it is, you do an action. And if it's not, you don't do an action. And so even if you think artificial intelligence and machine learning is incredibly complicated and almost mad Magical, it's really not at heart. It's actually incredibly simple. The magic happens when you get to something like 100 billion parameters or 175 billion parameters with like GPT-3. Then you can do magic, right? So you've got 175 billion of these matrix multiplications happening simultaneously. That is pretty incredible and pretty intense. And it depends a lot on how fast computing power is. But in theory, at least you could do it by hand. It would take you the, you know, the, the rest of the age of the universe or something to do it by hand, but you could in theory do it by hand. There's nothing magic about this. It's just multiplying an addition. And that is actually really, really cool. I love the fact that at heart, machine learning is actually super, super simple to understand. There is one other piece of machine learning that's super important, which is feed forward and back propagation. And I'd be really happy to do an episode on that as well. So if you do enjoy this episode, please do like it. So I know that you liked it. And also, if you want to catch that other episode, definitely subscribe to the channel as well. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. And I hope videos like this are actually fun for you guys as well. And if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And as always, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.